Hello and welcome to Unfiltered with me, James O'Brien, and this week's guest, the... Um, you're one of those sort of portfolio people, Kate Tempest, aren't you? Poet, rapper, musician, writer. Poet first, I think, and foremost. Depends what I'm working on or what um, what we're talking about. You don't like being interviewed, I've sensed in the past. I don't, I mean... And I think I know why, but tell me why you don't. It's not your favourite thing in the world. Um, I, I love talking to people... <laughs> about my work and I don't know it's I just sometimes I felt that um that, I don't know I, I, it's not that I don't like it when it's something interesting yeah or that or I feel like I'll tell you what it is I feel oh. like when I can have a serious discussion I really really enjoy it and in fact I relish the opportunity to talk about the things that I'm passionate about but occasionally, or in fact, frequently, I feel like I'm either kind of condescended to or patronised or sensationalised and it just gets a bit eggy, you know, it's like... I do, I understand. Get also, get... people talk to artists in this really funny way Go sometimes on. where they, when they interview you as if you've kind of fallen from heaven and, like, you've got all these interesting things to say about things you're not really qualified to be pontificating on. And instead of, like, having an interesting kind of meaty discussion about the stuff that you've developed expertise in or areas that you're really focused on, you end up getting kind of these kind of weird... Like you're kind of pedestalised. Yes. And there's the, that isn't an enjoyable place to have a chat. That's fame, isn't it? Is it? Because you are famous, you must be possessed of some quality that the rest of ordinary mortals don't. I mean, it's, it's bollocks, obviously, but yeah. it's, it's, where, <laughs> it's where perhaps the idea comes from. I don't know if it's fame. I think it's... Um, I just think it's a kind of strange convention in how we've we've kind of learned to talk to artists. Yes. It's a very it's a misunderstanding of the craft of. Well, you've got me on my uh, on tiptoes now. Then you got. <laughs> I feel quite relaxed today. So good. It's well, right, that's, I mean, right. good. You, you should. But I'm going to be editing my questions. I suspect as as I ask them. I thought it would also perhaps be to do with the uh, with the importance of the right words that that in your work. I mean, po poetry, you, 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 it, nothing is extraneous, is it? Nothing, everything is pared down to the absolute meaning. Whereas in normal conversation, particularly perhaps with a, uh, I don't know, a slightly eggy journalist, <laughs> journalist doing the interview, you can end up um, almost being misinterpreted or having your words uh, um, afforded a significance or a meaning that you didn't intend. I, I, just, I always end up saying too much because I get, I get <laughs> nervous. Like, and then I try and please... I'm just one of those kind of people that you try and kind of put the other person at ease, like, yeah. quite naturally. Like, and um, then I end up, like, talking too much and, like, revealing too much about myself. And then I just feel like it's not a very pleasant feeling when you kind of realise the next day, you're like, why did I tell that stranger who doesn't care anything about me? All those yeah. things about how I feel. But maybe they're good at their job. Probably very good at their job, and I just need to get better at mine. <laughs> well, that's the point, isn't point. it? You don't see this as part of the job, and also you put so much into your work that, that in a sense, you, you could be forgiven for thinking that there's nothing left to reveal in interviews, or there's nothing left to do in interviews. Let's, I don't know. let's begin at the beginning. Um, born in Broccoli, 1985, one of five children. Um, your mum was a teacher. Uh, your dad moved from the construction industry into into law. Do you remember that happening? Was it a sort of conscious journey? In the family? Um, well, uh, my dad did loads of things. He wrote poems and he was he wrote plays and things like that. I don't think he ever put one on, but he used to muck around doing all those kinds of things. It was a creative, bits. creative house. It was house. really creative. My mum was, did bits of teaching at, in, in Lewisham College. We, were, we lived in Lewisham. I moved to Broccoli later. Um, but then when I was... She then stayed at home and was a housewife and, and I stay at home, mum. And that was probably when I was about 10, so I remember that. Um, I remember when my dad was doing his... Um, what, the exams, the, the law yeah. exams. I remember where he used to work in the house, and that was always... I was, like, small enough to be... I must have been crawling around. <laughs> yeah. Happy times. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, well, why is that funny? I mean, because I'm interested in your childhood, and and already we seem to be veering into the reasons why you don't like being interviewed. Because I because you don't think I am genuinely interested. Don't think about me. Think about everybody who's tuning into it, who who already has a knowledge of you and your work and wants to find out more. So it's it's, it's not really a case of someone who doesn't care about you asking you questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, it's not even that. I just I just um. I feel like a bit... Go on. Um, I feel like when you talk about your childhood... Yeah. I like, I'm actually not the best person to talk about my life as I recall it. Because to be frank with you, I think, like, memory... My memory is actually not very good. Fair enough. And, like, I've, I've had... There's lots of reasons for that, but... Um, <laughs> Do you remember finding a voice? Oh, this is the thing as well that people ask all the time. Like that when the, the kind of epiphany moment. When no, no, just just when you first started expressing yourself creatively. Because not uh, every kid does. I mean, I'm talking more than Crayola. Uh, yeah, I remember. I remember always really enjoying reading, uh, like a hell of a lot. And I always used to feel very creative about. The, the reading I was doing and the, the music I was listening to. So when did you start writing? Um, really young, I think, um, but not not with not in not with the idea that that's that was anything unusual or no. It was more that I loved writing stories. And at home, it wouldn't be unusual because your dad was doing it. Your mum, when she was teaching, with stories would be the currency at home, a, a big currency. Other homes wouldn't have that, so you wouldn't feel that you were doing anything special or particularly interesting. Yeah, my dad used to make up lots of stories to us when we were young and also my grandmother, she um, she had loads of nursery rhymes and things like that. She used to be a nursery teacher and she knew loads of very long kind of morality, you know, those old school, like Victorian, yes. really long rhymes about like a, like a kid. It's like Hilaire Belloc and that, those, that kind of stuff, or even before that. I don't know who that, like, they were just, it was just my grandma, I don't know. Always had a moral message. Yeah, they're, they're quite dark. They are quite like, dark. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the best children's stuff is really dark. It's, it's, yeah. it's, the best children's writers understand the, the darkness. But um, uh, I'm interested. This is going to be a tough interview, Kate. I can tell you're not. It's, uh, but that's that's what? my lookout. Why? Um, well, I, 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 I don't know. You don't seem to enjoy talking about yourself very much, and we're here for an hour. So oh, we'll, no, we'll, we'll, no. We'll, we'll get onto the work imminently. Tell me a bit about school. Oh. Um. Yeah, I went to primary school in Deptford. <laughs> it was really great. I went to secondary school in Kibbrook in a place called Thomas Tallis. Were you, were you happy at school? Did you have a good time? Um, yeah, I loved it and loved it up to a certain point. And then when I got to secondary school, I, I was not having such a good time and I stopped them. Um, Why not? Stopped attending. Uh, well, just lots of reasons. Just whatever, you know. Did you have a good time at school? Uh, I was away at boarding school, so the comparisons oh are a, a little bit different and... Uh, yes and no would be the short answer. Looking back, I probably had a better time than I realised at the time. But but at the time, like most adolescents, and like you actually, I found a lot of solace in William Blake, which probably gives you an indication of, of what my inner life was like. But um, but I, I don't. I, I can answer that question sort of comfortably and fluently. You, I, I'm trying to pin down why you you don't think people are interested in you, or you don't think people will be interested in the answers. I mean, you're, you're a very successful artist, and it's it's not abnormal to be interested in. <laughs> In how that journey began and and unfolded. I just it just feels like I feel like uh, the things that I'm an expert in. Yeah. The things that I can talk. You've got to be about an expert in you, haven't you? Well, I don't know if anyone ever really is. Like this, that's my life and my childhood, and it's kind of yes. in a lot of ways it's it's private. You know, okay. that's like what also what's happening to a person when they're 14 years old is is. That is, that's kind of private, isn't it? Yeah, it's I guess like, so. I hadn't thought of it that way before. But I find it fascinating. I find people's gestation and development, especially if they're very creative, I'm fascinated by the building blocks in that process. But they are private. You're right. And then, what, and once you said, once you say, oh, you know, I had a really tough time, this happened, or this was the moment when this happened, then, yeah. then that becomes the narrative of your life. And um, I think when you're a writer, you, I don't know, you, 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 ha you have to be cautious about... Um, Putting yourself in an awkward place where where uh, you you may be yeah 
you say too much. And I understand where you're coming from on that. I, I also think it's probably tied to something you've said in the past about... Mm. Um, uh, it, it, being when you were young, not being able to deal with the way that your mind works, you've spoken about. Is that the kind of thing you regret saying? Or, or is that the kind of thing that you can <laughs> expand upon? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that for a lot of young people, hmm. um, the world can feel like an assault. Yes. Um, th- growing up in... South East London, where I grew up in Lewisham, uh, there was a lot of um, a lot of quite troubling stuff going on around yes. for friends, and and it was quite um, it's the kind of place where things can be quite extreme. So your your response to that mentally, your, your mental response to an extreme. Uh, environment is often extreme as well and I believe that we live in a time of a, a complete extremity and often the most sane response to the insanity all around us is is to slip a little bit you know mm. but um, when I was young I felt very passionate about music and literature like very passionate these were the things that I connected with almost like more fully more forcibly at a particular time of in my development than with the real world, you know, the okay. outside world. Yes. And um, through a very, like, engaged, passionate pursual of finding out more knowledge and finding out more more ways to experience music and literature, more like, have more access to them. I had this job in this record store um, and there were these bookshops where you could get all the classics really, really cheap, like 20p for... The Penguin Classics with the black and orange spine. All things like that. And then I made lots of friends in my... uh, When I was was about 13 or 14 through through a love of hip-hop and rapping. And and then my mind was um, kind of absolutely blown apart by live music, by what was happening in terms of hip hop events like DJs that I met like music it was live it was real and um, you, you we, we interviewed Dave Haslam recently and he, he talked about finding his tribe where, where, <laughs> wherever he goes yeah. wherever he's found himself in life he's always somehow been able to find a tribe it strikes me that's what you've just described I think yeah, I think a lot of people feel like that especially mm. when they when they are the kind of person who's uh I think born with the sensitivity of a poet, like yes. you know, it's it's an it's an extreme way of experiencing life, and I do think that poet is um in Brazil, poet is a praise word. Yes, it's what it's like. I would call you poet. It's a term of endearment, mm. and uh, you know, you'd say, "Oh, my poet," when somebody's being particularly sweet natured, sensitive, That's like lovely. open. You know, yes, of course. And I kind of have the idea about poet. That I know people that have been writing poems all their lives, but I wouldn't necessarily call them a poet. And I know people that have never written poetry, but I think of them as poets. So it's, I feel it's more like a kind of frequency that you're tuned into life at. And when you're of that um, frequency, yes. the minute you connect with others of that frequency, it's it's a big shock. You're of like, course. well, I found, I found somebody else who has this thing in them. And the musicians that I met at that time, I still play with today. Yeah. I wouldn't be here doing this, having this chat with you if it wasn't for the, the players and people that I met at that time. It's a beautiful thing to have community like that, musical community. For sure. If we, if we had to pin down what that frequency was, I'm thinking from other conversations that you've had in the past, that the word empathy would be very high up on the list of what we're describing. Um, yeah, probably. Yeah, empathy. Just a kind of fullness of experience. Um, I think the creative personality is a strange mix of like absolute conviction and um, a kind of crippling insecurity. Mm. And somewhere amongst all that, there's this current, this this very strong current towards experiencing, pushing yourself to the limits of experience so that you can really feel fully. You know, whether that's feeling fully empathy or yes. feeling fully other things. It's important if your sensitivities are open that way, I think. Keats said um, in a letter, not in a poem, he said something like, oh, for a life of sensation rather than of thought. 
Yeah, I could, I could imagine him saying something like that as in a letter. You, but that's what I can kind of, <laughs> that's what I'm hearing from you. It's as if when you talk about fully engaging, the insecurity is the thought. That's the kind of voices. And the, the, the poetry is the feeling, is the sensation. Living. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, and also it's quite Blakey in that as well, isn't yes. it? But, I mean, you can't have all sensation and no thought because you end up... Well, you'd be ahead in it. Not making much yeah, sense. And also, you never get anything written down. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm not looking for a big epiphany moment, or I'm just looking for some chronology. Okay. When did you start? I, I mean, you started rapping about 15 and 16. You've described it quite beautifully as an ecstatic liberation from an anxious adolescence. But you were you were writing before you started performing, yeah. presumably. What yeah, were you writing, and, and, and what, what did you get out of the process? Um... Before I started performing, what was I writing? Yeah. Everything. And I was writing terrible poems. Like, Just for yourself, mostly, yeah, was it? Yeah, yeah. And stories and, um, you know, like descriptive stuff. I was, I was seriously writing from about seven or eight. Like, seriously, that was my thing. Yeah. But then I stopped, um, I stopped writing or thinking that... I stopped realising that what I was doing was writing. OK. You know, it didn't... It wasn't something that I was uh, kind of actively trying to do. It was just a part of how I needed to make sense of the world around me or my own place yes. within it or whatever it was, the things that were happening. I, I'd like to write down um, uh, just happenings on the street or in a cafe or uh, just at the bus stop. I would quite like to often just sit there and describe it, stand on the street and just describe it as it was going on just to try and get better at putting putting the pinning the words on the yes. on the action i still love to do that getting the right words well, you never can no. you know you, you watch i did this um this amazing thing happened yesterday i got um oh. got an honorary phd from well london done. met do i have to call you doctor you don't have to, doctor, but I mean, you, you could if you wanted know, to. Okay, technically, fantastic. <laughs> but the, what was amazing about it was that I sat, you, you sit on the stage with the faculty and mm. um, then all of the students collecting their degrees come up to shake hands with the, um, the vice chancellor of the university. So I got to just sit there on this chair and watch 250 people like, on a really important day in their lives just come up, kind of beaming, like yeah. all their families are in the audience and... Um, and I got to just look at all these faces, like, in a, like unashamedly. Like it was, it was expected that we would be looking at these yes. like beautiful faces. Everyone, people like some kids or people were like, not kids, young people. You know, also the mature students. There was a lot of mature students, and um, you know, you're just looking, thinking like, how there's no way, no matter how skilled you become with language, there's no way of fully being able to describe how much you learn from a person by observing their face or observing a small movement some feature and you can observe and observe and observe but you can never imagine the movement that gives away the full depth of yeah. uh, of kind of knowing that you feel when you watch somebody suddenly dance across the stage and everyone cheering and then and then they get a bit shy the other side of the stage and i don't know it was are you sure that you can never quite because i mean th th that rather leads me to the question of why bother trying then oh because you try and you try and you try <laughs> but you'll never succeed like every time Every time you tr every time you write, you fail. That's the you, to write to make artwork to make theatre is to fail. There is no chance that anything you write will ever be as good as the idea. Will ever be as pure as experience. It's always failure, and and meeting that failure is a uh, and persevering through that failure is 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 what gives you the humility to to become a writer, to become an artist, to become a theatre maker. Like just knowing that this task is utterly hopeless. How do you know you've finished then? Because, I mean, it's, it's, I'm thinking of this Beckett who said, fail, fail again, fail better. That's right. That's a nutshell. Ever tried, ever failed. That's it. Try again, fail again. Yeah. Fail better. Fail better. Fail better. That's so, what it is. That's yeah, well, it is. And I, and I understand what that means, but I'm not a, 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 a poet, or, or at least not publicly. But <laughs> <laughs> so how do you know, if you know that you failed, how do you know that you finished? 
Oh, it's a completely different thing. Of course, you know that you finished. Like you, you like. <laughs> can, you, can you be any, any more dismissive of my question? <laughs> I was quite pleased with that one. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's, that's all right. I guess I'm, I'm rolling with it. The, uh, I think that when you are creating a piece of work, that you are always consulting the idea and trying to interrogate the idea and make sure that you can facilitate it which you can never do successfully, but you try your best to do it. And then right. you begin by knowing where you want it to go, hopefully, and you end by knowing that's, that's as much that's as, as you can give it. That's as far as I can go. So it's as if you're on a road. You're never going to reach the destination, but you know when your tank is empty. You Who know said when it? Like, it's never finished, it's only abandoned. Don't know. I Some, like it. Somebody, someone said that, um, uh, I think a writer, and that's pretty, I mean... Also, there's to be completely frank with you, it's, mm. you have deadlines. If you're, if you're yeah, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is true. Got to finish, got to hand it in. <laughs> and that sort of focuses the mind a bit, especially if you've already spent the advance. That's usually a very good way, <laughs> a very good way of ensuring that you get the work done. Um, right. So I, I, I'm thinking self-taught. Is that is that? I mean, if you really weren't much into secondary school, and yet your your palette of, of reference culturally is immense. So you were. Would you go with self-taught, or does that sound a bit pompous? Well, I d like, so I, I stopped going. So I stopped going into school when I was um, about thirteen or fourteen. I'd, I attended some classes. I, I attended a music class with a teacher that I loved. He's passed away now, actually. But um, I, w I would go to those classes, and sometimes I would be sometimes in the school. Yes. Uh, but um, in a different like just whatever. I wasn't really doing, but I did take the exams. Right. At the end of the thing, and. Uh, then I went on and I did a music BTEC at this college in Croydon called the Brit School, which was like an insane place to go because it's like a performing arts school. So you had you had music and you had theatre and you had film. You had kids studying like production, so people learning how to rig lighting gear. Hmm. Amazing place, but quite quite a culture shock to just suddenly be around so many people so committed to their their passions, their yes. talents. That was really unusual. I went with my best mate and... Uh, Your best mate went to the school as well? Together we... You, we both got we in. Went, we both got in, That's went right. to the audition, did our thing. And um, What was your thing? I, I went... In my audition, I was playing the guitar. I was playing Spanish guitar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very short time. It's hard to get into the school. You talk about it quite casually, but it's... it's it was mental, I couldn't believe massively it. Massively oversubscribed, isn't it? It was amazing, but again, like, um, so they 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 taught. Well, I was learning guitar there, but I stopped, and and then I were and slowly I, I I was giving more and more attention to the work that I was doing with my rapping outside school, and anyway, after all that, I um I got I did part time. Did a part time degree at Goldsmiths mm. in New Cross, and that was incredible because I got access to the library there. So the reason I'm telling you all this stuff about that is because no, I'm not self-taught. Like, no. I've been in contact with education uh, my whole life and also I've been in contact with an incredible community of other people. Yes. So I learned a lot from friends, from friends' mums and dads, like from experience, from my family, from uh, books yes. that I just always very passionately would devour about lots of things. And then, like, when I hit Goldsmiths and I was doing these evening classes with these amazing people, you know, like, there were small classes of people, like, you know, that had been working all day and had kids and whatever, you know, yeah. and, um, and we'd come together in the evening and it would be these quite rowdy discussion-based seminars and I'd never known anything like it. And I got this library card and so I got access to the library and I was reading academic books for the first time. I was doing like an introduction to politics. That was really, really inspiring, exciting class. Just, really cool, you know, and like kind of ha having to learn after not having been in academic study. I did study music, but it's not the same thing. You have no, to like. No, of course. So you never, you, you got off the rails of formal education, but you just went exploring yourself through the kind of. Yeah, and it was uncharted, amazing. Not on rails, doing whatever you wanted, pursuing an enthusiasm. I find that interesting. So I'll read that. I'll go to this because I like that. Yeah. As opposed to the sort of classic. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't. I went a bit later to. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, uh, yeah, I, I got to pursue different in, like pathways yes. into 
areas that I didn't know anything about. You, you, know? you, you mentioned a couple of times your areas of expertise. I, I hesitate to ask you to tell me what they are. Because <laughs> well, you I, said a few times that you're much happier talking about your areas of expertise than you are talking about yourself. Well, um, I suppose that the things that I know and I'm passionate about and that I've spent a long time working on are, um, is writing and yeah. performance. I would say that writing and performance are my areas of okay. expertise. When did you think about the future during this period? Because you've gone from secondary school to the Brit school to Goldsmiths. You've got a perf you found your tribe. You've found your voice. You, you've kind of did. When did you first, if indeed you did, it may have just sort of popped in, start thinking of a career, as it were. Well, what's interesting is that there was never a moment where you think of a career. Right. What happens is you become obsessed to the point of um, that it, it feel, there's no room for anything else. So when I discovered rapping, I was 15. When I started doing it myself, like I mean, I, my own rapping, I was mm. 15. I started doing it out loud at 16. <laughs> and Where were you doing it before? Just in, at home just in your not, own bed? Yeah, like not... I wouldn't have wanted to open my mouth and right. speak and join the I was I was hanging out with rappers and they would be rapping and I'd be listening I'd be enjoying it but I would didn't really feel like I was able to to join the cipher yet I had to do a bit more work privately okay. yes and then eventually at 16 I started to speak what I'd been writing and then from the basically from that moment um there was no other colour in the palette. That was it. There was no other. That was, was all you no, wanted to was do. Just, well, there was. It's not even wanted to. There was nothing else. Like that. That is it. That was life. Like. Um, it just was, to explain a bit more, if you can, because that that but that is, I think, for me, at risk of sounding pretentious, that's the difference between an artist and the rest of us. Perhaps. I, I, well, because of the like my my best mate who I just mentioned actually yeah. he's a drummer and he had he was a music he had music and I had lyrics and the and we both felt the same way about our creativity. So the rest of us don't quite get this, do we? But because there was people around me, yeah, coming with the same kind yeah. of commitment and passion to it, um, I realised that. It was unusual. I, t I started to realise it was unusual. Okay. But there was there's a massive community of musicians in South London where I grew up. Like like, and there was a lot of space for us to meet and play. There was a lot of squats around. There was a lot of space for us to be able to play for free or for like a tenner for like five hours rehearsal. Mm. It was not absurd to spend three days playing music, getting a gig. It was just part of life, and that, and it was very much part of how we socialised, part of how we understood ourselves, part of how we worked. Obviously, we had jobs, but the, you know, everyone needs, you know, a day job. But the, the energy was always, always involved in thinking about lyrics, writing them, rehearsing, trying to put a band together, trying to get some gigs, trying to get be heard, make a demo, make a CD, get a uh, CD played. In and, the and, and that, so there's no plan, there's no route, there's no map. It was it's it's like a visceral need. It's just every, yeah, it's like you know, it's like sixteen. Like, yeah. It's and, like, uh, and it, well, yeah, but I mean, sixteen-year-olds aren't, aren't necessarily that focused on doing something constructive and creative normally. But then you would even reject those words. You were just doing what you had to do. Um. Uh. I think that throughout my formative years and mm. up until about the age of 21, I was just throwing myself completely at it and not realising that I was frustrated that I didn't know how to move beyond a certain point. But but you were frustrated. Of, you of course, you, when, when you get to... Because you want more people to hear the words that you're... Yeah, at that time I wanted to reach reach more, be, well, that, you know, it, wanted to it? go further. There you go. So that's an ambition, but it's not an ambition in a materialistic sense or, a, or in a popular sense. You, you just considered the work that you were doing to be important enough to demand <laughs> and deserve a wider audience. At that time, that's exactly how it felt. I think um, you, 
you want to push yourself to a point where where you can be heard and and it yeah. because it's it's um it's an outward reaching ambition it's a social ambition you want to connect it's um it's about connection i think because you want people to be better to each other <laughs> um that's why the more people that hear it I don't know where it comes from. Like maybe I think maybe it's it's an you know an artist has always has a huge ego. Otherwise, why on earth would you stand up on stage or sit down to write? So you have to you have to separate the true creative ambition from the creative ego, and, right. and ask yourself: Well, was I desperate to be heard because I was serving this higher purpose, which is what I thought I was doing at the time, yeah. or because I wanted to? feel more justified in my personhood yeah. because outside of having this identity that set me apart from others, then, um, you know, I, I would, I could be bullied or laughed at or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it is at that time, you yeah. know, you're, you're an adolescent, you're trying to work out your place in the world. And so you, when I'm looking back and trying to unpick that, I can't say it was a completely noble, you know, pursuit of a higher connection. Although, I mean, it was, but probably at the same time, I was just looking to, like... So you're conscious of that look at me, Jean, then, the, what you call as the, the ego, the bit of you that wonders, am I just doing this because I like being on a stage in front of hundreds or thousands of people? Well, the thing is about that is that probably everybody who is on stage in front of that many people, I guarantee you, they might be up on that stage looking like they've never been afraid of anything in their lives, yeah. but 45 minutes before they went up, I guarantee they're in the dressing room with their head in their hands thinking, who do I think I am? And How am I going to do this? Why do I keep doing this to myself yeah. as well? What answers, yeah. do you, what answers do you come up with? Why do I keep doing this to myself? Well, the thing is, it's not about... The, the, as you grow older and you become more secure in your personhood... Yes. And you... you I try and understand what it is about performance or creativity that I am so bound to that... Yes. You you understand more and more that it's nothing actually to do with you. The more you get involved in it, the more you get in the way, to be honest. Like, all being well, you're a channel. And that's a, that's a difficult thing to say because when people start talking about channeling. But, but what I mean by that is, in performance especially, you're trying to bridge a gap between audience and stage and language and imagination and individual... And community, like yeah. you're, you're really trying to bridge that gap. And if you can take yourself away from it and just let it, let the words, let the music come through you, and you don't interfere with your nerves, with your anxieties, with your ego, with trying to please, trying to look after. If you just breathe and just let it happen, mm. then you become this bridge, and then there is transcendence in the room, and like. That's it's insane. It's mad. It's mad when that happens. It's how often does it happen? Um, it well, it happens with with brand new ancients, which was a long poem I wrote, yeah. which was the first. It was a seventy five minute long poem, a story that had a lot of violence in it, um, but essentially was uh, a kind of euphoric story. So it was a dark thing to summon, but yes. at the same time, it, it ended with a very euphoric feeling it was quite a taxing one to do and i had not done it before i had not done that kind of thing before and it ha in that transcendent moment would happen pretty much every night but uh it was too much for me at the time and i had to stop doing it because um i thought that some i thought that i was not going to be able to cope and it would you'd feel very, i would feel very drained and sometimes you you would feel once we were in new york I never spoke. This is what I mean about I speak too much. But. Well, you can tell me, remember, afterwards if you regret it, but I'm fascinated. Once we were in New York, I'd never been... It was amazing. We'd got, like, the thing... Had, the show had transferred to New York. It was in this amazing theatre in Brooklyn, and there was all these people in the audience, and it was quite a steep um, rake, I think they call it, yeah. or bank of seats like that. So you could really feel the, the audience from all the way up there, all the way down. And we, we got about 10 minutes in, and basically I, I felt like I was going to have a panic attack, like a... My breathing, I was became really aware of like my skin and everything just started going really weird and I felt like I, I was like, I'm going to pass out or something. Yeah. And then basically what happened was I kind of, I blacked out, like uh, I lost, I wasn't there. Right. And um, 
We got to the end of the spot, carried on, yeah. carried on with the words, got to the end of the show, like came off stage, like, and everyone, the guy, there was four musicians that played the show with me, and they were like, wow, that was a really amazing show. Like, everyone stood up, like, big standing ovation, everyone's going mental, like, you feel like you've just died, right. and you're looking out, and there's all these people, like, going mental. So, what your brain is telling you is that when you suffer like that, it's good for them. Oh, gosh. So, you, I was there back. Like, out after the thing, like, I don't even know what happened. Like, where... Were you scared? Yeah, because I, d I thought, like, what is that? Like, is that is that a panic attack? I don't know what that... I'd never had one of those before, so I didn't know if that was what it was. And then I was talking to my friend who's a musician. He says, you know, like, some people talk about... He's a guitarist. He talks about guitarists talking about that happening. You yeah. black out and, and you can play like you've never played before. So then... If that's if that's the case, if as musicians and performers we're aspiring to get to this place where essentially we we're so afflicted by the reality of like trying to go out there and do it that the, like the best the best thing that can happen to you is that you black out. Yeah, it's a it's danger. I felt like there was a dangerous element going on that I wasn't re I wasn't strong enough to to hold. So that so um. I decided that we c I couldn't do that anymore. I wasn't supported enough. Sure. I didn't have well, the experience. Well, people wouldn't know how to support you, would they, really? Because it's such uncharted water for almost everybody. I think that, as like, I think there are... Now I've learned that there are ways. Yes. There are ways to make that experience, like, more positive and safer for the people that are on stage. Because it is scary. Are we talking about the same thing, then? It's, it's interesting the words are so different. To black out is... To transcend. Well, no but, no, but when I was talking about the kind of the transcendent moment, yeah. I didn't mean that time. No, but like. But that was transcendent. But that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. that that was that was probably the most the most. Right? <laughs> but for me, it was terrifying. It was really dark. Where and were then, you? I was in this theatre in New York. Yeah, but where were you? Oh, I have no idea. That's what I'm saying, James. <laughs> it was you, like. Also, it was a mad time for me in my life anyway. Sure. Um, it's a big pressure, like, you know, that show was a big pressure. And I, anyway, now, with Let Them Eat Chaos, which was the last um, yes. album that we did, that was a kind of similar, in a lot of ways, a similar process. It's a long story. But that, it was just completely different because there was so much hope. I think it was the violence in Brand New Ancients that made it such a burden. Because right. every night you have to summon this violence into the room, it's a sexual violence, yeah. and it it was it's a hard thing to summon into your body and say, okay, that's where we're going to go, and like, you have to be responsible for taking people there. And um, with the, with let them eat chaos, it was um, it's positive. It's just much more positive, you know. The message is more positive, so we were more protected yeah, okay. on stage by what we were saying. So when you go out and you start the story, you feel more secure in where you're taking the people. Like you feel like you, you're asking them to come with you in this on this journey, and you feel much more secure asking them because you know it's going to end well. <laughs> you know, it's like... So it's exposure and vulnerability, but of two different flavors: one dangerous, and one ultimately uplifting. Or redemptive, is that a word that would fit here? The thing is, like, words spoken in public places are yeah. very powerful things. Of course. Like, in dark rooms, Yeah. you know, like, with lots of people, with drums. Like, this is ancient, this is, yeah. like, powerful yeah, stuff. Yeah, of course it is. And you can't take it lightly. It's and if, primal. There's something that happens, I like, think so. to, the, to our bodies on stage, yes. to the bodies in the audience. You can't, like, just because it's the music industry is a huge machine and get the ever since the Beatles people go on tour you know and da 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 you, you can't forget that what you're doing is like it's, it's really amazing it's like it's it's a very special moment that these people have come out like no matter what's happened in their day they've they've booked a ticket to this thing maybe their friend got them a ticket they've had to get on the train they've had to leave whatever's going on they've probably forgotten they had to do it then they've run out the door and then <laughs> everyone's got their own journey that they're bringing into this room and then they all stand together Everybody's experience is directly affected by the people around them and how yes. they are experiencing. And then you come out and you meet all of this mass of experience and you start telling a story. You can't take it lightly. You have to learn that it, this is... You have to give it the respect it deserves. And 
you know, without wanting to sound too far-fetched or too much of a lovey, like, that is how I feel about it. It's like, okay, performance for me is stagecraft is extremely important because it's very heightened. It's yes. like, it's access to, to community, direct <laughs> access, yeah. you know? So now I feel much more secure in my stagecraft. Maybe I could tackle something like Brand New Ancients again, but I don't think I would want to. But moving on... yeah. I feel more and more excited by the possibility of what, like a gathering of people to hear poems, to hear, they're like, it's, it's like spells, you know, it's like, it's, you know, sermons and all this stuff. The reason it's so powerful, that mm. religious language, because like you're standing, listening to somebody speak, tell these stories, like, it's a kind of, without, I don't like fancy myself as a preacher, but something happens that's a bit unusual when there's poems and music and you know hmm? and and an audience yeah but that, even if it's Does just it one when other person no audience? i never really tried it you, know, you don't get in the same place do you, you not so when you're writing and and, and composing it, it it's never actually finished until you've done it in front of people it's definitely not the same as when that's interesting because when you're writing it's one thing you're the writer yes when you're composing it's one thing you're composing when you're but when you become the performer of the text you, in a lot of ways you have to forget that you're the writer of it you have to you have to memorize it that's one thing mm. put it in your body and let it come through you it's a completely different experience and it's all about communication when you're writing you're in service to the idea when you're on stage you're in service to communication you're trying to be this bridge so it's all it's like it's completely different experiences. Like the, the written text is one thing, finished when it's performed, but this new book of poems that, I'm ri that I've written, um, I won't perform. You know that already? Yeah, yeah. It's not right to tour these poems. So they're just to be read? Yeah. So you won't feel any response or I mean, you'll get some feedback, but you won't be part of the feedback? I think that they will perform better with, you think other people more might... intimately with, with with somebody reading them, I think. Really? Yeah. Why? Because of the nature of the poems and the brevity of them and the importance of the page yeah. and the space around them and and uh, also the the time it takes to read. I think they should be read slower and I I have a tendency to kind of try and meet the space and go too loud and oh, too okay. fast. Right. So it's a more contemplative I think so, yeah. Project. I still think people should read poems aloud, even if they're reading them to themselves. I do. I, I think probably we'd all benefit from having a little bit more poetry in our life. But when I say that, I sound glib. <laughs> do you see? Don't I? That's why you're laughing at me. No, I, I do. I sound a bit glib. And yet when you say it, I, d I don't know whether it's because you've clearly, you suffer for your art. There's a torturous air sometimes to the way you analyse the process. I wonder if you ever wish you didn't have that. I mean, you wouldn't be Kate Tempest. You wouldn't be the winner of a Ted Hughes Prize and a, a, a double Mercury music. But there's a pain involved in what you're describing to me that I wonder whether sometimes you wish you were made slightly differently. What, um, what I can say to that is that this dream that I had when I was a kid, yeah. this, this compulsion that took over my life has become something that I am able to do for a career. And that is unbelievable i'm so grateful i feel so privileged so blessed i've had so much support from so many different places every single time i have a creative conversation with another another practitioner mm. i feel so full of gratitude that this can be my life this is this is unbelievable it's 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 extremely powerful to think back to the kids that we were yeah. telling each other, not if, but when, <laughs> not if, but when, come on, we just got to like, we're going to do this, like, this is going to happen for us because it's for the greater good and da, 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 da. Like, oh, I remember all these things. And like, when I put that, it, when I stand on the line that goes back to the beginning yes. and I position myself on that line, I can't believe how beautiful, how, what beautiful thing to be able to live a creative life. And most people who said not if but when in their teens didn't get to lead the life that you do well I think that like one thing that is sad is that you can be brutalised by the experience of being alive there is a lot that happens to a person that 
can make them lose some of their openness. And like creative careers aside, sure. <laughs> that is the sad element. And that happens too often and because of so many things. But no matter what happens in life, and I know this from experience, uh, you can retain your integrity and you can retain your openness. And it's that's, not easy. That's, but that, <laughs> what do we mean by integrity, Kate? Well, your, your service to your ideas, you yes, know? Yes, I do. And so you spend a, a lot of time thinking about process, a lot of time thinking about personhood, a lot of time defining the parameters of your professional and personal existence and they're, they're blurred right There's, you don't separate the two well actually increasingly i do but you think you have to flick a switch and well just like when i'm having like my life yeah. now you know it's kate calvert who hangs out with her partner or hangs yeah. out with her sisters or a brother or mum and dad and that like luckily that that isn't the same person that has to go out on stage and do all okay. the bits that that person has to do but well, they're both real people. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, they're both real people. Well, it's because I've interviewed a lot of artists uh, for a, a very long time. And it, it, it's, it's fascinating to, to speak to somebody who is so comfortable talking about the, the stuff that the rest of us don't really experience, you know? The, 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 well, you do experience it. Well, we experience the end result of it. And occasionally I understand most of what you're saying about transcending and most of what you're saying about creative urges. But I guess, I guess the difference between every adolescent that's ever written a poem and what you're describing to me is need. It's necessity. What would happen to you if you somehow were prevented from writing? Uh, um, I don't know. I mean, like... I <laughs> It's oxygen. The the thing about transcendent, it's a, it's a funny word to use because it's got so many connotations. But do you know, it's the word I had in my head before you said it, and I was trying to pluck up the courage to go. say it out loud to you, and but I didn't I mean, need to. Maybe a better way of describing it for the, for your listeners, yes. so it doesn't sound like such a load of kind it of doesn't, it doesn't, jargon. It doesn't, or, I don't think it does sound like jargon. Like, you know, it sounds a bit far-fetched. So but, we've all got a concept of being taken out of ourselves by art. I'm just not familiar with speaking to the artist about it as a consumer of art i can mention the moments in my life where i've almost been floating above yeah, the this room is it. yeah, yeah, yeah but, this but is as a, it. that would be as an audience member rather than as a performer the best way to describe it is is just is music yeah how music feels to, like that's it that's where you go when you make music so you go to the same place that music takes you it's, um, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I can't, like, it's so beautiful. And then sometimes it really isn't. Sometimes it's like, an absolute nightmare and you can't get there and it doesn't make any sense. And you, you're just like throwing yourself against these brick walls, you know? But you have to do that to have the successful moments. I think presumably. so. Like, at the minute, like, I'm working on a novel and I'm finding it really hard. And uh, that, I mean, when you, what do you mean when you say you're finding it really hard? Are you struggling to sit down and write? No, no, it's not that. It's, I didn't uh, think it would be. It's, um, You're struggling it's to like just, the stuff you've done. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, really? Like, How far into it are you? About two-thirds in okay. to the first draft. And I'm having a bit of a crisis. But I mean, I, the thing is, this is what I know in my sober mind, is that I have these... And this is maybe it's quite useful for people to know. Go on. Um, every single time I make anything new, yes. I have a complete... Uh, kind of artistic um, rejection of the idea of myself. Like, you know, you battle with this inferiority complex and you can't do it every single time I'm about to do anything, whether it's a gig or an interview or whatever it is, there's a part of me that is sure that I cannot do it, it will not be done, it is no good. And then the, th the, the flip side of it is this conviction, this like mad conviction that's like basically these two, um, this kind of seesaw yeah. of like, I can't do it. What am I doing? To like, there is nothing else for me to do. I must be able to do this. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna get it done. And and it sometimes it's happening at the same time. Of like, you know, you're having this awful day at the desk, and everything you've written is a nightmare. And at the same time, you know you're making progress, and you know that it's gonna pass, because it's happened every single other time before. <laughs> and all those times you made the work, all those times you got on stage and you did the gig, even though you 
you knew that you weren't going to be able to do it, but the rational mind, you, you know intellectually that it's going to be fine, but yeah. what you experience in your body emotionally is like, you know, like just crippling... Uh, Doubt. Yeah. So it's not the same as imposter syndrome. It's not that you feel you're a fake and you're going to be found out. You, <laughs> never, you never feel like that. But like to, to your to your like to your you may be found out by the by the idea that yeah. you don't have what it takes on this to, occasion to do, it to do this job to do this piece. It's so mad. But then it I think people must to have me. that with work. You know, yeah. with, with any with any vocation. Yeah, but that's why I was, that's why I mentioned imposter syndrome or, or, or feeling because that's not what I'm hearing from you. And almost every other guest we've had on Unfiltered at some point has alluded to a sense of fear that you're going to get a tap on the shoulder and told, "All right, you've had your fun. Go and get a normal job now. Go and get a job in a shop or an yeah, office." Yeah, or, I feel or, like, yeah, I feel that. Like, you I get that. that as well. Everybody has that. But the way that you create is so profound that you must it, it, it's not quite how have i ended up getting away with this that's not what we're describing <laughs> no 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 it's I, sometimes it's that sometimes <laughs> yesterday it? on the stage you're getting my phd from yeah. this, these amazing people i was like this is bonkers like you do have that moment but yeah i don't know it's a bit more like how deeper. on earth am i gonna get away with this yeah. rather than how have I got away oh, with it okay. it's yeah. like right. how am I going to do look the, to be honest with you like this isn't going to last forever I'm not stupid why like, not well because it doesn't like it, this is not how the trajectory of making artwork and people listening to it it, it, it does not last forever people will stop listening I will fall out of favour like whatever it's going to happen and at that point I will still be making work and I know that like right. and when, when I can't get so you're published, just describing the size of the audience like well I think what I mean is that knowing that is pretty healthy. It means that you're not you're not afraid of the moment the tap on the shoulder comes because you know it's going to come. Like you're going to not you know. And at that, I have a real passion to 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 teach one day. Like I think that that do would you? be incredible. I'd, yeah, I'd love to do that. You know. And I think that all of this, what I'm talking about, the kind of anxieties of stage and stuff, you don't want to do that forever. You don't want to put yourself through that when when you don't feel strong enough to go through that. It should be a choice, not an obligation. Yeah, no? okay. Uh, so, yeah, all right. I get that. I, I don't know that I agree with you that, that it will come to an end, but I, I can see why it's liberating to believe that it will. That's what you're saying. I think it's realistic, you know? Like... Yeah, it might be, but there are some people that go the distance. You know, for, there's Bowie and the, the, there are plenty of people who manage to have a lifelong career of, of weapons-grade creativity. That's true. But it's probably liberating to think that you won't be one of them, even if you end up being one of them. <laughs> Because the because that's the other thing like part of you part of every artist and maybe you're, in fact I know yourself in fact every single listener <laughs> likes to think to themselves that they they have what it takes to go the distance yeah. like I'm somehow I'm I have it I have it like I sure. can what I have to but at the, at the same time like you, you shouldn't I I believe that you shouldn't kind of count yourself among the greats but you should be in communication with them and you should. You should see them as counsel, you know, like, yeah. I don't think that you should feel inferior yeah. to, to great works of art or great artists. They're, you're on a level with them. They're here to teach you. They're, they've got lessons for you to learn. And it's a give and a take. So you have, to, you have to feel part of a tradition, part yeah, of a yeah. process, part of a broader narrative, which brings us to the new book, which is... Um, you've mentioned it. Se seamless. Well, I am pretty. It's what I do, mate. Seriously. I hope you're taking note. It's transcendent. <laughs> Let's not get carried away. <laughs> Running upon the wires. You, you've yeah. given us some sort of clues as to what can be expected. It, are people going to be surprised? I mean, are, are people who are familiar with everybody down and let them eat chaos and some of your other work, are they, are they going to be surprised by this book? Is it, is it, is it what the critics would call a departure? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. But I think like, I think all of the things that I've made have been. You do what you want to do from each other. Yeah, I mean. So where did this come from? So running upon the wires is a new collection of poems that charts the end of my marriage into heartbreak and despair, and then out into the kind of redemptive. Uh, glow of new love and then th even further into domesticity and buying new sheets and um mm. the idea being that rather than it just being like a kind of, a kind of breakup album i thought the, the more useful prospect to offer the world was to stay to stay with the speaker of these poems 
and see it through. And rather than finish there in the heartbreak, see it through, you know, make no bones about it. It's pretty, you know, it's depression and drunkenness and promiscuity and all and all the stages of heartbreak. And, yeah. But then, to, and to see it through and to not stop there and to keep going with the poems. And so it's it's actually it's um it's a short. They're, they're very short poems and they're quieter poems and so they're, they're moments, more intimate. Moments in your. They're poems. Yeah. They're, it's a book of poems. <laughs> Was it always a book of poems? Uh yeah, yeah yeah. I've been it's... I've been writing it so it's the last you know you, the way that it works when you're on the road and da 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 and you're making work and you write you're writing what you can in your time. Mm in between whatever else is going on, whatever else you're working on. And this is just what's been happening over the last few years. And so these are the poems that have been kind of coming out. And I spoke to my editor, Don Patterson, and I sent him a few poems like a a couple of years ago. I said, this is what's going on. This is where I'm at. And he was like, well, okay, maybe it's a book of love poetry. And and maybe that's, that's okay. Like, you know, I've always written these in all of my poetry collections that have yes. been the more tender poems and more intimate poems about relationships but the conceit of actually sticking with the relationship poetry was like something pretty terrifying why because this will be the first time the perspective has been the first person yes um why do you do it to yourself I think it's I think it's really useful and a really beautiful thing to offer the offer the world like so you're making the personal universal. Uh yeah, I mean I think that with this the I in the poem is not um it doesn't distance you. I feel like the I becomes you for the readers. I f- I think so. Yeah. And um also, it's like, I mean, it's just a mad thing to say, but like, you know, I've got a deadline, got a, got a, this is what I've been writing. you finished This now. is what's happening. It's out in September. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, I was thinking, well, I could write a whole other book of poems that isn't about what's just been happening in my life, but this is, this is what I've got. So. And the poems would be there even if you weren't published. You'd be writing the poems to deal with the, or, or is this a slight departure in the sense that this is part of a progression? Well, hopefully all the work is a progression. Like, of hopefully. But, um, but professional progression then? In, my, in terms of my professional progression, yeah. uh, I feel like the, the way that I work is in like um, chunks. So okay. I would count Wasted, which is a, my mm. first play, and Hopelessly Devoted and Brand New Ancients and Everybody Down and The Bricks That Built The Houses at, on one hand. That's, okay. that's like a chunk of work. It all belongs together. Let the meet chaos is kind of in the middle. It's, right. That's that's a little stepping stone in, into a new chunk, and then there are four or five things that that form a new constellation. That's yes. the best way to think of them. They're like constellations. They have relationships to each other. And you don't know what those relationships will be until until it's all finished. And even then, you don't really know. But you know that they are. Yeah, well, they come. They 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 overlap. Their, their gestation overlaps. Their create the creation overlaps. So I'll be writing them all at the same time. I'll be touring one thing, editing yeah. another. Okay. So they have, they're part of each other's growing up. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's interdependent in a sense. Yeah. They feed off each other and, and speak to each other. And so running upon the wires is the first of a new... And do you know at this point what else is going to be in that constellation? Yeah. Are you comfortable talking about it or do you... There'll, there'll be a, there's a new album which it will follow in April, which right. is also a departure, you know, is a new... And uh, there's a play that I'm working on which will be probably which hopefully will be ready in next year, maybe. And that's also a departure and is part of this kind of new new set. And then if I ever finish this novel that I'm trying to <laughs> smash out, then that will be a part of it as well. Spend the advance. I have to submit it before I get the advance. Do you? <laughs> you just get a new agent. <laughs> <laughs> just got to get a... Um, yeah. You don't have ambition in, in a conventional sense, then? You're not, you don't, do you worry about money and stuff like that? Because I, I, what in terms of will this m- book make money? No, I'm thinking more about something. Martin Amos is called Tramp Angst, which he has, and Christopher Hitchens doesn't. And they used to discuss it, so they both were making 
one of them believed it was still possible for him to end up sleeping on a park bench and the other one had done the sums and realised that he was never going to. It's emotional rather than financial or statistical. Right, okay. But when you were talking about discovering your tribe and being in squats and doing stuff that you needed to do, it struck me that you probably never really worried about financial security or, 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 or a mortgage-free existence. Well, the, f the thing is, <laughs> is that at the minute... Um, I don't have to. I don't have to worry, because of all the work that I've been doing. Yeah. About the rent for. You know, a few, you know, for a few months. You know, you've done enough. This stuff, it's all, it's it's all there. You're you're in this moment, which you've been working f towards your whole life of being able to support yourself comfortably, with your work, so yeah. that you can do your work, yes. right? And then this is what I'm saying earlier about, you know, it's not going to last. But mm. like I talk about it with my partner and it's like, well, if we get to a point where I have to get a job or like a, like a you know, not like a normal job, then that, that's what's going to happen. Like, and that doesn't it's not going to break my heart to no. get a job. Like, it's going to be obviously a bit of a shock to suddenly not be on stage <laughs> and to be like, you know, doing something else. But teaching would be great or like... Caring somehow, nursing, like I could train that. Like there's loads of things that I would like. There's a whole, there's other lives. You're not, that I you're would... not, this is the final question. You are not frightened of it all ending tomorrow. Or well, are you trying really hard to convince like, yourself that you're not frightened? It would all? be heartbreaking <laughs> for like many reasons, but it might be the best thing for the work if no one was listening to it, you know? Because like, I don't, I don't in fact, I mean, that might be absolute nonsense, but like, <laughs> I, I think where I'm at right now, I'm in a beautiful relationship. I'm very happy and I'm in love. And it gives me a very strong feeling of security Yes. about, like, no matter what else happens, actually. Like, I, this relationship that I'm in uh. is so beautiful. Uh, and it gives me so much courage in my work, in my calling, my purpose as an artist, that um, I believe, <laughs> I believe in it. In in love and in creativity, which is an act of love, and I, I kind of think because I'm in that because I'm in that moment. If I don't have to come and do interviews anymore, if I don't get to go and to play gigs around different places, like you'd still be blessed. Yeah, absolutely, and I mean, I I hope I hope. Please, I'd still be able to write, and I wouldn't get bitter, and I, you know, I wouldn't be one of them. I could, you know, I could have been a contender. You know, <laughs> I would really, really hope that it, right. it can be twenty years down the line, and I can still be feeling fresh with it. I think you're going to be all right. Let's we'll see. I think you're going to be all right, Kate Tempest. Thank you. Thanks, James O'Brien. <laughs> really lovely. Hello, I'm James O'Brien. Thank you for watching this episode of Unfiltered. Not only is there plenty more where that came from, but there's plenty more to come as well. So make sure you subscribe to Unfiltered and put yourself at the front of the queue for all forthcoming interviews.